Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Girl with the Scalpel. This is Dr. M. I am here to help you out with your dental board exams. In this channel, we discuss about the difficult topics. What are the topics from which the questions might appear in your dental boards? And my videos are for everyone, be it a fourth year or a third year you know dental graduate or somebody who is already done their dentistry and want to just brush up their concepts and for somebody who's appearing for their INBDEs somebody is appearing for their Canadian dental board exams for their Australian dental board exams the ADCs ORE and even DHA you know guys the topics which we discuss on this channel are really important from the academic perspective. Why? Because these topics can help you out during your preparation and make you exam ready. So in the last video, as we discussed about the treatment plan and what should be done whenever you are dealing with a medically compromised patient. So this is the second video to the special series of the medically compromised patient. So today's topic is again a very important one. Why? The take home messages here I am going to tell you before the video so that you be there with me, stay there with me, listen to the entire video and understand. So the take home message would be the antibiotic profile axis which has been changed. In 2022, the new guidelines have been issued and that is really important for your dental board exams because many new questions would appear from that topic. The, you know, uh, the time when I did my graduation and the antibiotic profile axis and in which situations those antibiotic profile axis should be utilized were slightly different. Now, many of uh, these situations have been eliminated. That is, in certain conditions, now you don't need to give the antibiotic profile axis. So, from this video, you'll get the insight to that. The main reason for discussing the antibiotic profile axis is one, for your own knowledge whenever you're treating a patient. And second, very important because new questions are definitely going to appear in your dental boards. Okay. And discussing the infective endocarditis, if you know about infective endocarditis, only then you can understand the importance of antibiotic profile axis. If you know about the endocarditis, what is endocarditis? So today we'll be discussing it just in brief. So without a further ado, let's get started. But guys, do forget, don't forget actually, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the bell icon so you get an update whenever I upload a video and uh, guys you can follow me on my instagram page that is girl with the scalpel i generally keep posting about what topics i'm going to discuss and i know it's been kind of inactive because i was busy with my personal life and now i am kind of getting back into track so stay tuned with me so let's dive in into today's video so first of all what is infective endocarditis so it is a microbial infection of endothelial surface of heart or the heart valves that most often occur in the proximity to the congenital or acquired cardiac defects. So clinically and pathologically, a similar infection that may occur in the endothelial lining of an artery usually adjacent to a vascular defect or it could be a prosthetic device and the situation is known as infective endarthritis. So, although the bacteria most often causes these diseases, even fungi and some of the microorganisms that may cause such infections, such as such designation of infective is used and it can be used for diseases which are even multimicrobial origin. So, the term bacterial endocarditis is in common use reflecting the fact that most cases of infective endocarditis are caused by the bacteria. So again, uh, before discussing the epidemiology, I want to discuss about the classification. So it's like it's been like for ages that we used to discuss about there are two types of conditions for infective endocarditis or 
i.e. that is it can be acute or it can be subacute now it has been replaced guys it is very important you need to understand this the classification has been replaced and now it is based upon the microorganisms so the microorganisms it can be a streptococcal endocarditis a staphylococcal endocarditis or it could be even candidal endocarditis so now we don't use the acute and subacute terminologies now the classification has changed and now it has come and become and replaced based upon the type of microorganism or the bacteria then second of all the type of valve which is infected now this is the second type so now we know it is based upon bacteria now then it is based upon well this is this is the classification so depending upon type of valve it can be a native valve endocarditis a prosthetic valve endocarditis post displacement also it can be classified based upon the source of infection either it can be a hospital acquired one or it could be a community acquired one and last of all whether the community acquired one is based upon the intravenous drug abusers so the classification is based upon the types of bacteria the valve and how the infection is acquired whether it is community based or it is hospital based or it is via the drug abuse right now coming on to the epidemiology as you can see here i have presented here certain datas now guys these tables and these data i have taken all the content from the book it's an excellent book by little and fallis it is the management of patients who are medically compromised in dental office the link to the book would be there in the down in the description box you can purchase that book and i must suggest you you must you must get that book because this book has really great insights it will clear all your doubts all your topics see the topic of management of the patients in, who are medically compromised is very important from an academic perspective because many questions appear from that some of your pharmacology and your drug interactions are very nicely explained in this book then all the lab investigations which are necessary for any disease are given in this book and last and for all if at all you're in your clinical practice you tend to attend these patients you are encounter these patients very often and you need that knowledge for yourself right so guys do check out that book it is excellent so coming on to the epidemiology of the infective endocarditis so it is basically it's a life threatening disease as we all know but it affects more than 15000 patients every year in united states and the mortality rate approaches to 40% so which is somewhat even worse than cancer so the infective endocarditis is relatively a rare disease that can occur most frequently in middle aged and elderly so the incidence varies with the population which is studied so in a general population as you can see here in the data the risk is ranged to about 5 for 1 lakh people and previously the most common underlying cause was the rheumatic heart disease however in developed countries the frequency of rheumatic heart disease have markedly declined over past few decades and it is more of a less significant factor on the contrary the mitral valve prolapse which accounts for nearly 25% as you can see here in this data that is it accounts for 25 to 30% and it is now the most common underlying cause again very important mitral valve prolapse very important also the aortic valve diseases either the stenosis or even regurgitation appear to account for nearly 30% of these cases so the incidence of the infective endocarditis is also quite prevalent as we discussed in the iv drug abusers and conversely among the patients with the infective endocarditis the concomitant rate of iv drug abuse ranges for about 5 to 20% so based upon these two tables and these data you can identify that how gruesome this disease is and something needs to be done about this 
So coming on to the etiology. Now about 90% of the community acquired cases. Now here we're discussing about the new classification. That is based upon the community acquired disease. Now the cases of native valve infective endocarditis are caused by the streptococcus, diphylococcus or enterococci with streptococcus being the most common cause or the most common causative organism. So infective endocarditis is associated with the IV drug abuse or secondary to the healthcare contact. So staph or the staphylococci are the most common pathogen. So if it is a community acquired it could be even a strepto, a stephia or enterococci, strepto being most common. If it is a situation with the IV drug abuse, then staph or the staph aureus is the most common organism. Then coming on to the viridans or the streptococcus viridans, which is also popularly known as the beta hemolytic streptococci, constituents of the normal frola, sorry, is the constituent of normal flora and the gastrointestinal tract remain the most common cause of the community acquired endocarditis without the regard of the IV drug abuse which causes more than 30 to 65 percent. So the species that are most commonly which cause the endocarditis are the streptococcus sanguis or oralis or salivaris or mutans. A group D streptococci which causes the streptococcus bovis or the enterococci are normal inhabitants of the gastrointestinal tract, right? And these two microorganisms can cause about 5 to 18 percent of the problem. Then coming on to the staphylococcal infection. Now staph as we discussed is more common in the IV drug abusers. So basically staph aureus is the cause of the most cases of acute IV sorry, infective endocarditis and is the most common pathogen and it is also is the most common pathogen for the non-valvular cardiovascular device infection as we discussed based upon the valve classification, right? There are certain other microbial agents which can also cause the infective endocarditis but they're relatively lesser common. For example, Haemophilus, Actinobacillus or Echinella, right? Now coming on to the pathophysiology. So what happens here is, so basically although the precise mechanism is or how it occurs has not been fully, you know, discussed, but there are certain sequence of events which occur. So the sequence of events which lead to infection usually begins with the injury or the damage to the endothelial surface. And uh, although the infective endocarditis can occur or normal endothelium, but most cases begin with a damaged surface. The damage could be because of the directed flow of the high velocity jet into the endothelium that is with high blood pressure or flow from a low to high pressure chamber. For example, if you have certain situations where there is a defect in the chamber, again, the situation can occur or the flow across a narrowed orifice at high velocity. Now here we're talking about hypercholesteremia, right? So what happens is post the damage now here the damage has already occurred right onto the endothelium then occurs is the fibrin and platelets then adhere to that roughened endothelium again because of the sequence of the healing where they form small clusters and masses resulting in a condition called as a non-bacterial endocarditis or a non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis so a similar frequently indistinguishable condition is found in some cases which are with the SLE as well. Now initially these masses are sterile and do not contain any microorganism. So with the occurrence of the transient bacteremia however the bacteria can be seeded and adhere to this mass. So now the damage has occurred the fibrin and the platelets have stuck to the roughened endothelium. First it is a sterile mass then transient bacteremia occur with a due course of time. And post the, when the bacteremia has occurred, the additional platelets and fibrins are then deposited into the mass which serves as a sequester and protect the bacteria which undergoes rapid multiplication. So for example, this is the damaged endothelium, right? Now here, the platelets and fibrin has been occurring. 
so what happens is now first it is a sterile medium then the transient bacteremia occurs with this situation and now the bacteria has been harboring in here so for example this is the bacteria which is in blue but now it is harboring and even more layers of platelets tend to stick here so that the ingrowing bacteria rapidly multiplies so after the vegetative process is established this metabolic and the cellular division of the bacteria are diminished which decreases the effectiveness of the antibiotics so the bacteria are slowly and continuously released from this into the blood stream the bacteria is slowly and slowly released here resulting in a continuous bacteremia the fragments of these friable vegetations break and embolize off it goes off right and a variety of host immune responses to the bacteria can occur so basically there are certain sequence of events which occur that is the local destructive effects of the intracardiac or the valvular lesions then embolization of the vegetative fragments to the distant site resulting in infarction as we discussed then hematogenous speed seeding of of the remote sites during this continuous bacteremia an antibody response to infecting the organism the subsequent tissue injury caused by the deposition of the preformed immune complex antibody complement interaction with antigens deposited in the tissue now, although the combination of antibiotics and surgical treatment is effective for many patients the most common complication of the infective endocarditis and the leading cause of death is the heart failure right that is really important and this pathological process most commonly begins as a problem with the aortic valve involvement followed by the mitral valve or even a tricuspid valve now the embolization of the vegetation fragments often leads to further complications such as a stroke why because now the emboli has you know been removed from the blood vessel it can go and occlude any of the smaller arteries Which can lead to a CVA, cerebrovascular accident, or stroke. So, an MI can occur as a result of the embolism of the coronary arteries and distant emboli, and can produce a peripheral metastatic abscess. So, the pulmonary emboli, which is usually septic in nature, what happens here is that is mostly in 66 to 75 of the intravenous drug users who have tricuspid valve, they have endocarditis. Now emboli may also involve other organs like the liver, spleen and kidney as well as the mesenteric vessels. So basically it can enter the other systems of the body as well and shut them down. So that is why it is a really gruesome disease. Now coming on to the clinical presentation, I'll be showing you certain pictures too in the upcoming slides where you can really appreciate what are the signs and symptoms. So the classic signs of the infective endocarditis actually includes the fever, heart murmur, positive blood culture, although the clinical presentation may vary. So of particular significance is that the interval between the presumed initiating bacteremia and onset of this infective endocarditis is estimated to be less than 2 weeks in mostly 80% of the cases. 80% that's too much. and it is like less than 2 weeks now in many cases of the infective endocarditis that have been purported to be caused by the dentally induced bacteremia the interval between a dental appointment and the diagnosis of the infective endocarditis is much longer than 2 weeks and even some months now coming on to the signs and symptoms now fever which is the most common sign of the infective endocarditis can occur in mostly 80 to 95% cases then there are changing heart murmurs which can occur now the diagnosis of the infective endocarditis should be considered for a patient with fever along with one or more of the cardinal elements so the clinical presentation of this ie is generally variable the first the duke's criteria was developed and later it was modified to facilitate the definitive diagnosis So it has been divided up into two parts that is the major criteria or the minor criteria the application of this diagnostic criteria 
basically involves ascertaining the presence or absence of any major or minor criteria. So the major criteria includes the positive blood culture, evidence of any endocardial involvement that is a positive finding of the echo. So these are the two which are important. Then the minor criteria includes predisposing heart conditions or IV drug abuse, fever again very important in 80 to 95 percent cases. Then is the vascular phenomena including the embolic events, immunological phenomena, then microbiological evidence, a definitive diagnosis of IE requires presence of two major criteria. That is one major or three minor criteria, or all the five minor criteria. So based upon these criteria, either it can have the two major ones, or it can have one major and three minor, or it can have all the five minors, and then it is definitive of an IE. Right? Now there are certain peripheral manifestations which do occur because it is caused by the emboli or the immunological responses and are less frequently seen since because of the use of the antibiotics now. So these include generally the petechiae on the extremities as well as for us as dentists in the buccal and the palatal mucosa these petechiae are very important. Then there are Osler's nodes. So what are Osler's nodes? As you can see here, the tips. So it is a small, tender, subcutaneous nodules that develop in the pulp of the digits. Then it can even cause Janeway lesions, which are small, rhythmatous or hemorrhagic, macular, non-tender lesions on the palms and the soles. Then it can have even a splinter hemorrhage, and uh, which is in the nail beds, as you can appreciate here, the splinter hemorrhages of the nail beds. In infective endocarditis so sustained bacteremia is typical of the IE and the blood culture results are positive in most cases although 30% of these cases of the IE usually are found as culturally negative with strict diagnostic criteria are used only 5% cases are culturally negative apart from this they can have rot spot in the eye very popular and very important even nail clubbing can occur in a few weeks with the development of the IE. So this nail clubbing can occur in other cases as well, but it can occur in patients with infective endocarditis as well. So coming on to the lab and the diagnostic findings. So in addition to the blood culture, as we discussed, the diagnosis of the infective endocarditis is aided to complete blood count with differential electrolytic panel, renal functional test, urine analysis, plain chest x-ray, and even ECG. So the patients with the IE frequently are found to have a normocytic, a normochromic anemia that tends to worsen as the disease progresses. The WBCs may or may not be elevated. The parents of chest x-ray may be abnormal with a heart failure evidence. ECG may show certain evidences of conduction blockage. So an echocardiography, uh, transthoracic or the transesophageal is used to confirm the presence of vegetation in the patient suspecting IE. And echocardiography evidence of vegetation is one of the major criteria as we discussed according to the Duke's criteria. Then is the medical management. Now based upon different microorganisms, different criteria have been there. So the most strains of the Viratan streptococci and the group D streptococci, generally they with the minimum inhibitory competition or the MIC value of less than 2 micrograms per ml. So the, the regime as you can see here is usage of penicillin as given here or even ceftriaxone 2 grams 4 weeks and ceftriaxone could be used or it could, can be combined with a daily dose of gentamicin is appropriate for uncomplicated cases of infective endocarditis which are caused by a highly penicillin susceptible for a dance group then for patients who are unable to tolerate the penicillin or ceftriaxone vancomycin can be used so the patients with the infective endocarditis the next criteria this as we discussed so the patients with the endocarditis arising as a complication after surgery for the placement of the prosthetic valve 
or any other prosthetic material that can be used are highly are caused by highly penicillin susceptible strains with the minimum inhibitory concentration less than 0.12 micrograms per liter should receive a 6 weeks therapy right with penicillin or cefraxone with or without gentamicin for the first 2 weeks then those with endocarditis which are caused by a strain that is relatively or highly resistant to penicillin should receive a 6 week therapy with penicillin or ceftriaxone combined with gentamicin vancomycin is recommended only for patients who are not able to tolerate the penicillin and ceftriaxone then coming on to regardless of whether the infective endocarditis is community or the hospital based s aureus organism generally produce beta lactamase therefore the condition is highly resistant to penicillin so the drug of choice for infective endocarditis which is caused by the methicillin susceptible staph aureus is one with the semi synthetic penicillinase resistant penicillin that is nephicillin or even oxacillin sodium so for patients with a native valve of s aureus six week course of oxacillin or nephicillin can be utilized here right then there are certain conditions in which surgical intervention may be necessary to facilitate a cure of the ie now the indication of these surgeries include the moderate to severe heart failure which is caused by valvular dysfunction or even obstructed prosthetics prosthesis or infection so these are the regimes which can be utilized as you can see here on screen and uh, it is discussed and it should be known to you in which situations what drugs need to be understood or needs to be considered that is penicillin should be given then in cases of where when a patient is not able to tolerate uh, just the penicillin or the resistance then you can use ceftriaxone again not able to tolerate you can go in for vancomycin and if the, in more resistant cases you can even go in for nephicillin right and in cases with the fungi infection where the fungus is the one which causes these uh, conditions then those cases fluconazole or amphotericin which is a systemic antifungal agent should be given now coming on to the most important part that is the dental management so why is this dental land management very important so dental management is very important because it first of all it should be considered the decision to use these antibiotics sh- should be made based upon the practitioner and uh, basically many questions appear in the exam from this topic so let's discuss about this so the antibiotic prophylaxis for patients at high risk of adverse outcomes from bacteremia induced infection is recommended with certain procedures and it should be directed now guys i'm taking all the data and the table from the article which is published by the aha and uh, i will be linking it down in the description box you can download the pdf you can study it from there so there are recent changes made by the american heart association regarding the guidelines which have removed the use of clindamycin so you ma- guys must be familiar with this antibiotic regime so this antibiotic prophylaxis why it was given earlier just to protect the patient from any untoward incidences if somebody who already had infective endocarditis or somebody who had certain conditions which needed prophylactic antibiotics this was the regime which was followed now earlier on amoxicillin was given if patient was not able to tolerate amoxicillin then clindamycin was advised but now the things have changed why because the clindamycin has been removed due to frequent and severe reactions the clindamycin is why it is removed because it has been associated with significant adverse drug reactions related to the community acquired clostridium difficile infection so now the doxycycline has been added this is the recent guideline as you can see here i have just linked there from where i have taken the data it has been published by 2000 in 2021 by the american heart association and you should learn this by heart because many questions appear from this also doses should be given 60 to 30 minutes before the procedure so 
The doxycycline is recommended as an alternative for patients who are unable to tolerate the penicillin or cephalosporin or even macrolides. So the short-term use, less than 21 days of doxycycline, has not been associated with any dose discoloration which was earlier considered. An antibiotic profile access should be given at least 60 to 30 minutes before the procedure. Now, a different class of antibiotics is indicated if the patient is already on oral antibiotic therapy or has an allergy to the anaphylactic reaction. So, if a patient is receiving a parenteral antibiotic therapy for the infective endocarditis or any other infection, same antibiotic can be continued for the dental procedure. And if possible, the elective procedure should be delayed by 10 days after completing a short antibiotic course, right? And when the procedures involving infective tissues are performed or a patient with compromised host response, additional doses or a prescribed pre- and post-operative course of antibiotics might be necessary. Now coming on to certain situations or the, the key findings. So according to the AHA, the guidelines have recommended certain situations as you can see here in this table that is uh, antibiotic profile access prior to certain dental procedures for patients with the highest risk of outcomes right of the bacterial endocarditis or the infective endocarditis so basically here as we can see it has been divided up into somebody who has prosthetic cardiac valve material Right? So the antibiotic profile access for any dental procedure, if you want to take up, if the situation is there, there is prosthetic cardiac valve material, right? If there is previous relapse or any recurrent IE, then antibiotic profile access is necessary. If there is any of the situations like the CHD or the congenital heart diseases, now in this, what is necessary to understand that if it is unrepaired, only then you need it. If it is completely repaired with the prosthetic material, whether placed by a surgery or by transcatheter, the first six months of the procedure, if you're doing anything before six months, then repaired CHD with the residual defects in the sites adjacent to the site of prosthetic patch or prosthetic device. And in conditions where the surgical or transcatheter pulmonary artery valve or the placement such as melody valve is there. In that situation, antibiotic profile access is must. Now, the antibiotic profile access is not suggested. This is of utmost importance because these have certain changes. So, if somebody who has an implantable electronic device, such as a pacemaker, no antibiotic profile access is required. If they have septal defect closure devices, when complete closure is achieved, antibiotic profile access not required. Then, peripheral vascular grafts or patches, in which includes the hemodialysis, not required antibiotic profile access. Coronary artery stents, no profile access. Vena cava fillers, no profile access. Certain other pledgets, no antibiotic profile access is required. Then coming on to basically, so basically any dental procedure and any antibiotic profile access is required. So antibiotic profile access should be given in all the dental procedures which include the manipulation of gingival tissue or the periapical region of the tooth or perforation of the mucosa and the associated conditions which we just discussed. Now it, is, it shouldn't be given in anesthetic injections from non-infected tissues, dental radiographs, placement of any removable prosthetic device or orthopedic implants or placement of any orthodontic brackets. This is very important question which appears quite often if you have an orthopedic or the orthodontic brackets what should you do and shedding of primary teeth bleeding from trauma from lips or oral mucosa again here antibiotic profile access is not suggested unless they already had that condition right only then and in those situations and we just discussed only in those situations antibiotic profile access is necessary right so According in addition to those and the guidelines which have we listed here, antibiotics are recommended for all the dental procedures for the gingival tissue which is discussed. So if AHA has also found no convincing evidences for microorganisms which are associated with the dental procedures 
which cause infection of the cardiovascular implantable electronic devices and null valvular devices so the infection occurring after device implantation most often occur by staph aureus or the coagulase negative staph follow cocci and or any other microorganism of non oral origin so aha does not recommend any prophylaxis again very important aha does not recommend any prophylaxis for devices such as septal defect closure vascular grafts patches any av shunts vena cava fillers so this again a screenshot has been taken from the article and many questions would appear for the upcoming dental board exams on this criteria i am pretty sure again the management of the patients with the prosthetic disease undergoing a dental procedure so basically the clinical recommendation is that in general for patients with the prosthetic joint implants antibiotic prophylaxis are not recommended prior to any dental procedure so a patient with a history of complication which is associated with joint replacement who is undergoing a dental procedure and includes a gingival manipulation mucosal incision any prophylactic antibiotics should only be considered after the consultation with the patient and their orthopedic surgeon whether it is like necessarily required to assess the patient's status a complete health history is always recommended then clinical reasoning for this recommendation there is evidence for dental procedures which are not associated with the prosthetic implant infection there is evidence of antibiotics provided before oral care do not prevent any prosthetic joint implant infection and uh, there is a potential harm of antibiotics including the anaphylaxis the resistance and even opportunistic infections especially in cases with clindamycin which is caused by the clostridium difficile the benefits of the antibiotic prophylaxis may not exceed the harms of the patient so the why this clinical recommendation was given for any prosthetic joint replacement these are the clinical recommendations by right so this brings us to the end of today's video